Cry Andre is just an ordinary boy out playing with his friends one day. An arrogant looking, delinquent boy with a sword looks at a group of kids saying one day he'll attain riches and glory one day. All of them are pumped up on board with his idea, even the weird kid with a box on his head. The red-headed boy named Luke Cycle is able to convince the kids to all become the best heroes in the world, having the dream of going to the imperial capital, Zabrudia. Treasure hunters are seen as celebrities of the world and stars in the imperial capital. They travel all across the world to dungeons, opening treasure vaults, risking their lives fighting monsters called phantoms, all for glory, with the strongest being the world's heroes. Several years from now, the group was exploring inside a large ruin in the desert. The team just arrived in the capital and they already started to make a name for themselves as beginners. But Cry knows they could be faster. He's attacked by a monster, Luke manages to defeat it in one hit, bursting in a shower of blue blood. Cry is shaken from this as he didn't even sense the monster, while everyone around him is acting as if they saw it all along. Luke believes he was just acting as bait. This is when he realizes the difference in their abilities, as they all share the same goal, but his friends all have way more extraordinary talents as he thinks the pink-headed girl Liz Smart tries to get his attention. The rest of his friends try to pull him out of his thoughts, but he still doesn't pay attention. Cry believes that sooner or later, he's going to hold them back from reaching their full potential. When they get back home, he makes a patient speech to them. With a heavy heart, he thanks them for everything, prepared to leave the party. But before he can, Luke cuts him off, realizing that the group doesn't seem to have a leader yet, declaring that it should be Cry. This scares him, but the others naturally agree to this proposal. Cry panics as his friends didn't even listen to his speech, and just as always. But this is when it marked the end of his life. As from this point on, he's been the leader of grieving souls with his gifted childhood friends, wishing he could just retire as a hunter already. Back to the present. The LV-1 loser hunter is walking through the rain with none of his childhood friends by his side. While walking to his destination, he notices a large crowd outside a large tavern, all hoping to be picked up by a powerful clan. Clans are a collection of pirates who come together under one flag. In this world, there's truly a limit to how much a solo hunter can accomplish, no matter how powerful they are. If you wish to make a name for yourself and have a stable career, it's paramount you get into a good party and grow in strength alongside like-minded comrades. Cry overslept coming here, and now he has to wait outside in the rain in line. A girl behind him catches his attention to calm her nerves down. Her name is Ruta Runebeck, and she's a level three amateur hunter. The heavy-chested woman recently got promoted and reached out to befriend Cry, but the virgin is afraid to touch girls, so she gets rejected. Ruta has been a solo hunter up until now, so she's trying her chance to get picked up by a powerful guild reaching her limit as she couldn't get the treasure from the white wolf den. A scar-faced older man interrupts her, calling her noob hunter, as he believes a clan won't take her. He tells her that where she's from, she might be considered strong, and even in the grand scheme, might be a mid-grade hunter. But she's nothing but a beginner. The two escalate their argument large enough more people are paying attention to them, all to the dismay of Cry's head and to his ever-growing headache. With Ruta ready to fight the older man to settle things, that's when the guards blow their whistle, telling them any more of this and they'll eliminate any chance to get in their clan. Inside, Ruta stays with Cry. The country girl is shocked to see so many high-level hunters. She's overwhelmed as this is her first time turning to ask Cry, he tells her it's his fifth. None of this shocks Cry as hunters all prioritize skill over anything else. Those with talent can instantly make a name for themselves, just like his old party. A large clan is holding interviews for potential talent to join their ranks in the pub, named Ark Brave. The clan managed to complete a level seven treasure vault with only six members, meaning they were extremely efficient and talented, telling Ruda that this is what an elite clan looks like. With this being the first time they've accepted members through one of these interviews. Looking to the far side, she sees one table empty, making her ask who's supposed to be there. That's when the tanned man from earlier, Greg Zangief, tells her that it belongs to the founder of the First Steps clan system. Greg says that most of the people came here to try and meet them and join their party, being the reason why so many solo hunters came. The Grievers, being the clan Cry's talented childhood friends belong to. 
As they speak, an arrogant young man with a red-gemmed sword calls out to the crowd, demanding that the grievers come out, declaring he'll be the strongest hunter one day, saying they've been honored to accept him into their party. The boy is a level four hunter. He's annoyed when a girl walks up to him, asking what her problem is. The black-haired girl with two ribbons is named Tino Shade, says she's here to put him in his place. As this is what her sister would have wanted her to do, as the griever's spot belongs to her. The guard tries to get her to calm down, as the vice master told her specifically not to make a scene. Saying not to waste time on this idiot, the idiot Gilbert Bush is annoyed by being called an idiot, but the guard doesn't care as he's level four making noise and he already has enough to deal with. Greg is happy to hear there's going to be some action and calls for people to make some room. The other hunters enthusiastically move the chairs and desk. The guard moves aside and Tino starts jumping. Cry tells Ruta to come with him as if they stay inside, they'd die. As Cry is trying to make his escape from the pub, Greg is about to start the match. Just as he does, Tino is able to notice an energy source she remembers. When the match starts, she loses her concentration and kicks the wall. Revealing Cry's hood and the girl Tino, cutely asks what her master is doing. Roden walks over noticing him. Glad he's here as now they can start. The news of him being the clan master shocks all of them. As in this golden age of treasure hunters, he's the one that stands out the most. Being level eight, Cry is still sick from the previous night of alcohol. Cry now sleeps at his table while Rudas and Greg watch from afar, afraid of going over to him. As Rodin tries to talk to him, Tino stops him, calling him a fake pretty boy. The older man laughs off her hatred of him going to pat her, but she quickly escapes. Roden believes he was walking amongst the common people in a grand plan to find the best talent, but Cry quickly denies this again as he overslept. Tino believes the man is too insulting of him and demands they strip his name from the clan rosters. Tino is the apprentice of his childhood friend Liz, a natural Sundari. Roden asks if he's seen any potential party members. Cry says that his roster is full, asking if he'd have room. Roden doesn't hesitate to offer a spot. People listening to their conversation can't believe the trust he has. Even Roden's closest companion tries to get him to reconsider. She waves her off, but says he'd only add one person. Tino starts to shyly wiggle as she's honored to have the chance, but affirms that she'd only join his party. Just then, more commotion is made as the spiky, red-haired boy is being held back by the guards. Cry gives him a chance, remembering he's level four. Gilbert still doesn't give him respect, bragging he uses the purgatorial sword. Cry deduces that he won't be powerful for quite some time, but after he's properly trained, he could be an asset, ready to recommend him to Rodin. But first, ask the boy what he believes is the most important thing for a hunter. Cry answers, telling him it's strength, as without it, he'd put the rest of his party in danger, declaring his will not to lose, stating he's never lost as a hunter. Tino praises him, and this shocks everyone. Taking out one of his rings, he declares to the crowd that anyone who gets this ring will be recommended to Ark Brave. He flings it to them, and as Gilbert is about to pick it up, he gets a knee straight from hell by Tino. Knocking him out, Cry says goodbye to Rudas and Greg, departing. As the pub is turned into a war zone, the next day, Eva Renfield, the vice captain of the clan, gives him the paper. Cry made the front page news as the pub was destroyed by the brawl. Cry tries to push all the blame onto Rodine and his clan, but the association doesn't want to hear it and calls for him. Cry doesn't want to do it as his reversible face relic is broken. The device lets him disguise his face. At the association headquarters, he does a perfect 180 degree bow to the chief with his secretary trying not to laugh. Gark Welter cuts him off as he knows he's just trying to rush out of here. The secretary, Kana Noss, tells Cry to calm down and tells her boss not to scold him so hard. Even though Gark hasn't even scolded him yet, Kana gives him a book of chores to do. He tries to pass it off to Ark again, but finds a level three corpse retrieval mission, leaving. Kana is amazed by his energy. Gark is surprised how he always manages to take on the most dangerous missions. While Tino is trying to show her master the ring she got, Cry is looking around for Ark, who apparently was summoned by nobles. Kreis then asks if the girl is free. Tino blushes, saying she's never been more free, as she's waiting for him. But once she hears it's not a date, but a quest, she bolts. Cry doesn't chase her, but uses his holding chain, catching her. A bound Tino never imagined her maiden heart would be deceived like this. As he tries to defend himself, a heartbroken girl says that all she wanted was to go for some ice cream or watch a movie. 
Tino reveals that she's not strong enough to complete this quest, making him look at it and to her annoyance, assign her a team. In the first steps, Pub Cry assembles the notable hunters from the previous day. The group still has a hard time believing that this meek looking man is the master of first steps and the strongest clan. Shocking them as he's known as Thousands Tricks, being a level eight hunter, the nickname makes him embarrassed. Nicknames are big deals as they are handed out by the association and are like celebrity tags. Gilbert being the muscle brain boy he is, can't believe that this scrawny man is the strongest hunter in the capital. Tino, like always, is the ever so devoted minion, deeming that they all should bow to master, has wasted 90% of their lives otherwise. Tino can't work with an idiot who's all talk, calling them the worst. Gilbert groans and Cry sweats as that perfectly describes him. Cry wonders who called him the strongest and is immediately reminded of Chibi Luke and Liz yells their lungs out, calling him the strongest. Now, years later, everyone believes them. Cry gets back on topic, asking if they can work together to help Tino complete the mission. Luke flings his fingers in disgust, not wanting to take orders from a fake level eight hunter. Greg tries to calm him down, asking if this idiot doesn't know who he's picking a fight with. Gilbert gets into a fight with Greg, and Cry agrees, saying it's fine, as he's given up on the young Gilbert, shocking all of them. Turn to the others, they agree to help, but are hesitant. Gilbert questions what does Cry mean when he says he's giving up on him. Not acknowledging him, he rubs Tino's head, and the girl blushes, cutely asking that master come with her. Walking away, Gilbert's pride can't take it, and he challenges thousands' tricks. Cry glares at the kid, as he says he won't listen to anyone weaker than him. Cry puts Tino in the middle, as he'll face her as the party leader. Tino tries to get Cry's attention by showing off that she can perform any position he needs. Gilbert declares that Cry's next after he beats her, as last time in the bar was nothing but luck. Tino drops all her weapons as she'll hold back as to not kill the idiot. The others are unsure for her as thieves aren't hand-to-hand -hand fighters. Cry agrees with the assessment partly, but there's a difference as all her experience comes from solo grinding unlike Gilbert. But his sword, the purgatorial sword, is powerful and could decide the fight. But Gilbert's pride won't let her take such a handicap and he says he won't use it. Tino reminds him that she's garbage compared to Master, then bounces on her feet, happy to get ice cream with Master after she wins. Cry reminds her that he never said that, but after some pouts, he agrees. In a blink, she's already in front of him. Gilbert is late to react, but dodges. But the heel of her foot is planted on his face, sending him racing across the wall. A bloodied Gilbert declares it's not over and runs at her but is put into a headlock with her foot. Tino, in her dominant tone, reminds him she's holding back, saying from now on he will worship him as God three times a day or she'll break him. Gilbert manages to break free, but is given the anime chop to the neck. Tino wins, giving all the credit to Master's training. Cry sighs as he's done nothing to train her. Gilbert remembers a flashback of him as a kid in his small town where he was the strongest kid destined to be a hero. Eventually, he was able to beat adults, then went to the capital to join parties. Thinking he was the strongest, Tino wakes him up from his dreaming, saying he should use the sword if he wants to continue, but Gilbert quickly refuses. Tino frowns as that's just his useless pride talking, calling it worthless as it'll get him killed. Cry is able to tell that he left his party as the difference in strength was too great for him to handle. Gilbert can't believe he guessed this correctly on the first try. Cry says it was the same for him. This shatters Gilbert's beliefs as it makes him think Cry was willing to party with weaker hunters, asking why he showed them mercy. Cry touches his sword and is able to easily identify its elemental power and ways to improve. What shocks Gilbert is that he's not even able to wield it with such ease as he can't even summon flames with this much power, calling him a monster. Wolf spirits haunt the white wolf den as their race was hunted down for its fur to the point of extinction. The mine is a rich source of mana, being a power that is invisible to the human eye. With him thanking Eve for giving him the report on the mines and young Gilbert's backstory as it helped convince him to stay in line under Tino. Eve states that she was simply doing her job, but mentions that he made quite the show in the hall. Cry attributes all that power to his relic, believing that Gilbert was able to produce small flames without knowing what he was doing, so he'll be powerful in the future. Cry rubs his rings like a real collector, wondering if he could buy the sword. This begins to annoy Eve as she hates spending wastefully, reminding him of another relic he should collect instead. This reminds him to go get his relic recharged. Two older hunters tell the master about recent news, 
where caravans have been getting attacked by phantoms from the north. The Knights of the Third Order are looking for party members to eliminate them as the phantom is stronger than level three hunters. The two believe that there are swarms of wolves making their way to the White Wolf Den. Cry tries to reassure himself it can't be wolves going there, as that would mean he'd have to do something. The two continue to talk about the recent attacks by the wolves and the level of opponent they managed to kill. Looking back at the mission report he got from the association, he can see the pictures of level five hunters he needs to rescue, something he didn't read. Cry mentions to the two that he sent Tino's party to the white wolf den and their faces pale. They don't yell at him as they assume this is the famous thousands trials that made the grievers the top party. He walks away believing that Gilbert is strong enough to handle this, but is reminded the boy didn't charge his sword after his display of power. With Tino's party, Rudas starts to have a strong feeling for the mission. Tino agrees, saying the master perfectly organized the party to complete it. Greg raises his hand, not believing he had such foresight to plan all this, as yesterday was their first time meeting. Gilbert agrees, since he just happened to be free, but is reminded that the guy knows his background and reasoning to leave. Tino cuts in as he now realizes that the master has extensive knowledge, calling it child's play to read their thoughts and plan accordingly, given he knows every hunter in the capital. Ruda can't believe this. But Greg understands, as this is Thousand's trick. Tino reassures them, as the master knows all this and wouldn't let them be in any real danger. Meanwhile, Cry holds his head as he's completely messed up, as even if he calls for backup, no one could make it at this time. Cry pulls a book from his study. The bookshelf slides, opening his private vault. At night, the group runs into a powerful phantom. Cry panics as the relics he normally uses isn't where he placed it. Coming out of his room, he's caught red-handed by Eve. Eve knows he's worried about them, asking if he's sure he doesn't want to take anyone with him. Cry is sure and sets off flying. What scares her is that the relic he's using was known for blowing off a person's head. Back with the party, the group manages to defeat the phantom, but it proved to be a tough fight. Ruda and Greg both start to have second thoughts about accepting this mission. Gilbert notices that because of the incident in the guild, his sword is out of mana and he's unable to recharge it. Greg believes that because the level of the mission has been raised and the people they need to rescue are most likely dead, the association shouldn't punish them for going back to reject the mission. Tino is unfazed as this is all a part of the master's plan, as he wants them to execute a level eight task and collect the bodies, with him taking away Gilbert's mana to force them to fight without relics. Outside the cave, he group sees a group of red wolves wielding swords, bows, and guns. This worries the group, but Tino is able to analyze that their species came to fight outside because the cave is too narrow for them to move. Gilbert understands the plan and is ready to act as bait. Tino wonders if he's an idiot, telling him not to be rash. The master expects her to act as a leader, so returning with all the members alive is the bare minimum for success. Tino decides that she and Ruta will get their attention because they are nimble, then the boys will assault their backs, reminding that they all live and don't use each other as shields. In the sky, Cry is on the verge of puking, hoping that at least Tino will be alive, happy if she uses the rest of her team as meat shields. Inside the cavern, the group is able to defeat the wolves because of their great teamwork. Tino believes her group was random, but is convinced it's not too bad. Gilbert is arrogant but strong, Greg is experienced with parties, and Ruda, while not special, is a competent thief that gets the monster's attention, allowing Tino to go all out. Gilbert remembers yelling at his weak party members and him leaving because of the large gap in ability. Now realizing they were desperate to improve and keep him, but he never considered their feelings. Fighting alongside a party is fun. They make it to a large, spacious room. They stop and Tino is able to sense the boss nearby. Greg believes that maybe they should go back. Tino tells him that being cautious is good, but being overly cautious won't help him grow. Greg sees her point as he's always ran away when he felt an enemy could hurt him. With this situation being influenced from seeing many of his friends dying, Tino says that the master knew this about it, hoping to change all of them. As Tino is too busy glazing her master and God cry, Ruta cuts in wanting to know why she was chosen. Tino takes a moment to look at her, realizing the same thing as us, because she has big boobs. While the others are hesitant, Ruta shows no fear. Tino instructs Gilbert to block, 
Greg goes in for a slash at its legs, and Tino finds an opening to defeat it. In an opening on the side, a spear is launched at Tino. She manages to dodge. From the entrance, the group can't believe it, as four more white wolves walk out. Tino is forced to signal a retreat, but the wolves block off the escape route. Greg looks at Gilbert, and the boy nods. The two decide to be the bait to let the ladies escape. But Tino is wondering if the master planned for this. Not believing it, she remembers the ring she won. Gilbert blocks the wolf's swing. Then Gilbert, with his new sword, is able to pierce the leg of the wolf. Ruta is able to get close to throw daggers at its eye. With this, Tino remembers target practice with this relic and fires a shot at its eye. The white wolf is seriously injured. Gilbert believes this is a good chance to strike. Tino tries to tell him to come back, as the boy is next knocked against the cave walls. Gilbert apologizes, and Tino tells him it's all right. Looking at the four wolves, they believe it's over. The wolf is knocked to the wall as Cry tumbles in. The other wolves begin to back away, recognizing this human. Greg wonders if they feel fear. The downed wolf goes to attack, but it's blocked by Cry's protected relic. This frightens the wolf. Cry tells it too bad as he has 17 lives, blasting it with multiple beams of energy. Cry calls the move flashy but not powerful, breaking his necklace and using it as a smokescreen to escape. Telling the rest of them to run, Tay Group runs at Tino's speed because she's injured, while the master proves to be out of shape. Tino remembers being rescued by slave traders who were going to kidnap her as a little girl. Grieving souls saved her, wanting to join their group since then. Cry heals her injured thigh and tells the rest of them to keep walking. As they walk, Cry is completely lost. Looking back at the girls, he wonders why neither of them are taking point. As thieves are naturally the ones they have the best sense of direction. Tino comes to the conclusion that all of this is training, as the exit is back where the boss is at. Ruta, now knowing it's training, asks if he could at least tell them where they're going. Cry, having no idea, keeps walking, leading them to a fork in the row. The group is shocked by sensing the survivors running past him. The hunters thank them for saving them, and Tino brainwashes them that this is all Cry's planning, everything. Everyone believes him even more. Ruta can tell them out of energy. Cry offers them chocolate from his special box. Hearing from the leader of the level five hunters, it's clear that the white wolves are not the boss as a more powerful phantom is alive. As the humanoid wolf is the embodiment of their hatred. Even with a known level five lancer, he stood no match in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Saying it might be on the level of the capital's strongest swordsman, Thousand Sword. This being his party member, Luke, who used wooden swords, a complete sword junkie. Being a level six hunter, not believing it's a match for Luke, as he would have come down here himself to defeat it. Ruta turns to Cry, asking what he'll do. He turns to Tino, saying this is her mission as the captain offering her point, because he believes it's too scary, but doesn't say this. The leader of the level five party thinks that his group should act as bait, but Tino doesn't allow this, as it goes against her master's teaching. And with him here, they have nothing to fear. The group hears the wolves howling, meaning they are on their way. Cry is worried now as he's down to six protection relics, meaning he could die. Cry gets in front of Tino, believing he can at least land a lucky shock if he rockets towards it. The boss wolf walks out. Ruta for the first time is frightened, feeling its intent to kill. Behind the monster is Liz Incognito, but the party sees this as another wolf boss. Tino is frightened, asking the master to protect her, saying she'll work hard and complete any other mission. Liz knocks the boss away with a single kick, then walks up to Cry, asking if he brought new party members. Liz darkly looks at the others, asking if they don't know who she is, as they can't be hunters if they're unable to recognize the grieving souls. She's sad as she rushed home, only to find out he went to the treasure vault to rush here as she was sure this must be some type of mistake. Tino is ready to wet herself as her master Liz is disappointed that her own apprentice can't handle some trash monsters. Gilbert tries to say something against this but is instantly knocked to the wall. Lucky he's alive. Liz yells at him as she's not done with her apology. Liz believes that maybe she's been a bad instructor or maybe the girl lacks talent or ambition. Liz goes on a complete tirade with the girl, as everyone will think she's incompetent and hate her if she dies, remembering that she practically raised the girl. T is on the verge of tears apologizing. Cry is able to calm her down by saying Tino did well. This does a complete 180 in her attitude, congratulating Liz on learning how to hold back. 
the wolves interrupt them. This annoys Liz as, because of Tino, these monsters believe they're weak. Liz puts her mask back on and is able to stop time. Grabbing all the bullets and putting them in a square neatly to show just how fast she is, yelling at the wolves for thinking tools built by civilians could hurt her. Liz has long surpassed weapons and physical limits. Turning to T, she can't believe she was afraid of slow, pathetic weapons like these. She reminds her that with enemies like this, you blow through their heads with force, doing an ax kick that completely cuts the wolves in half. And with an enemy like the boss you evade, she then pounds the boss into the ground while telling her what she expects Tino to do. As the girl needs to work harder than her a hundred times over, as the gap between them is widening, all the grievers constantly work to improve and outperform each other except for him. He checks on the girl asking if Liz has calmed down now. The girl smiles, believing she has mostly. Liz Smart is the fastest person in the capital with her godly speed, not even leaving a shadow behind. Liz hugs him as the mission is complete. Back at the clan building, Gilbert offers to give his sword to Thousand's tricks as he plans to go back and start all over with his old party. Greg tells him to apologize properly with them and Gilbert agrees. His goal is to be as fast as Liz, but they all agree that this feat is impossible. Tino gives him a word of advice if he's trying to reach her level. Six years prior, their masks were made, and Cry forgot to add eye holes, but everyone only pointed out the benefits of the mask. 